Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. We are in our verse-by-verse study of Revelation, moving right through it. We are in the midst of the woes. In chapter 9, for the last two weeks, well, it began with the eagle flying through the, he- through the heavens in chapter 9, crying out, whoa, 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 because of the last three trumpet judgments that were still to come, and we've gotten through two woes, and we have one woe to go. So one woe to go. I'll have a woe to go, please, with a side of wrath, a cup, a cup, a cup filled with the wrath of God. Uh, so we have one woe to go uh, today uh, before we get to the seventh trumpet. In the seventh trumpet, I keep telling you this so you'll, you'll understand there's actually kind of a, a nice, simple little outline to Revelation. Um, it's simple, but it's not easy. But the simple outline is three sets of seven, take care of the seven-year tribulation. So When we get to the seventh trumpet, which is the last of these three woes, that trumpet opens up seven bowl judgments. Those seven bowl judgments end the tribulation. They bring the tribulation to a conclusion. So it's a very big place that we're at right now. I've told you before that in each one of these sets of seven judgments between the sixth and seventh, there's an interlude. There's a pause. It's like, it's like, it's like in the book of Psalms when, when uh, I used to tell Brenda, you know, do you see the word say law? And she would say, law. She didn't. She's right. <laughs> Selah. It means, woo, take a break, man. Just rest. And so that's what this is. It's a pause. It's an interlude. And this is a big one. It actually covers uh, two major events in between the sixth and seventh trumpet judgment. That's where we're at. Let's pray. We'll jump in. Lord Jesus, your word is alive and powerful, Lord. It's a discerner, God. It discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart, and right now, in Revelation especially, Lord, we need your word to pierce our hearts personally, Lord. Protect us from the the grocery store tabloid uh, interest in Revelation, and instead, Lord, may your word do its work in our heart personally and specifically, Lord. And so, God, we open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears, and we pray, word of God, speak. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, Revelation 10, verse 1, the sixth trumpet is finished. Here's the pause. It says, then I saw another mighty angel. That's an important phrase, another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. Now that's a majestic angel. That's a mighty angel. That description we've seen before, but here it is given to this this angel called another mighty angel. And so scholars are divided uh, on this. Some think that it's just that. It's just, I don't know how you say just, it's just another mighty angel. But there are other scholars that say, wait a minute, that description and the following context really leans to this being Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ showing up at this critical moment at this pause before the final set of seven judgments come in all the events of the the tribulation that are famous you know like uh, next week are the the witnesses and we get into all the stuff that you know, the Antichrist and all that stuff. It's all coming. And so this is a real critical uh, position or point in the tribulation. And this description fits the Lord Jesus. Look again at it. He's surrounded by a cloud. 
He has a rainbow over his head. His face is shining like the sun, and his feet are like pillars of fire. That description leans to it being the person of Jesus Christ in, in appearance. But here's the deal. The, Jesus is never called an angel in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord was most often, if not always, a manifestation and appearance of Jesus Christ. And so Israel knows the angel of the Lord. We know that the angel of the Lord is a description in the Old Testament of, of most often Jesus Christ. And so H.A. Ironside, Henry Ironside says this, Harry Harry Ironside, I forget his first name. Harry, we'll, we'll go with Harry. Is anybody's name Harry? Your uncle? All right, all right, just checking. Uh, all right. Hey, Joshua, you should know. Is it Henry or Harry Ironside? Yeah. It's H.A. I was saying we need to bring that name back, Harry. Yeah, 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 no, no. No, I don't think we do. Um, that's why he goes by H.A. <laughs> he died in the 20s or something. It's, it was, he was, anyway. He says this. He says, I, I believe this is Jesus Christ appearing to Israel as they know him. Because the second half of the tribulation is all focused on Israel. I mean, God is dealing with Israel in a good way uh, for the last time. And so Henry Ironside believes, or it's Harry, I don't really remember. Um, I should start actually reading these guys again. Um, he believes that Jesus Christ is showing up as the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament because Israel knows the angel of the Lord. They just don't know yet that that is Jesus Christ. But by the end of the tribulation, they know that it is Jesus Christ. That's pretty cool, right? That Jesus would show up in a way that Israel specifically knows him because the second half of the tribulation is so much about them. Donald Barnhouse, another scholar who uses his first name, uh, <laughs> he says this, this is super cool. There are three occurrences of the angel of the Lord, or I'm sorry, of another mighty angel. There's three occurrences of another mighty angel in Revelation. Listen, listen to what they act as, the role that they act as. Revelation 7, this another angel or another mighty angel acts in the capacity of a prophet. That's Revelation 7. In Revelation 8, this another angel, mighty angel, acts in the capacity of a priest. Here in chapter 10, we're going to see that this mighty angel acts in the capacity of a king. And, and you may or may not have heard this, but it's, it is a classic teaching that Jesus Christ plays three key roles in our lives, prophet, priest, and king. And so this is how we know Jesus as our prophet, our priest, and our king. And every time this another angel or another mighty angel shows up, he is functioning in one of those roles. And so it seems like the description and the connection of his roles really lean to Jesus. We can't say it for sure because God chose to say another mighty angel. But here's, here's what I want you to know right off the bat. God's word is so incredible. It's so miraculous. The mysteries in it are so deep. The, the, the information, the details are so perfect and exact that it's too much to grasp. The word of God, you will never stop being amazed if you continue to dig into the word of God because it is, it is, it's unfathomable. You can never reach the depths of the word of God. And so knowing the incredible, supernatural, divinely breathed out word of God makes us more confident. It makes us more sure, and it makes us more glad that we put our faith in a supernatural, miraculous, divinely breathed out word from God instead of some religious document written by man. 
And, and I think it's really, really important that I stop and say that because first we've got to ask ourselves, why do we believe the Bible? Because there's a whole bunch of religions out there, uh, and I just between services, I just Googled it because I forgot to. Um, you know, some people like say five major religions and the rest don't count. Some say 12, some say 20. Uh, Google says there's over 4,000 religions on this earth. And, and I used to be posed with this question, not so much after a while, but I, I used to be posed with this question, why? Why are you like solely focused on the Bible? There are so many religions in the world. Why, you know... What, what makes the Bible different? Well, I'll tell you what makes the Bible different. It's 66 books written by 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents, and it's one complete story without contradiction, no matter what the you know, unbelievers say. It's not. It is miraculous, all done without Google Docs. It, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible. In Israel, there are 25,000 documented archaeological finds that support the Scripture, and there are zero archaeological finds that prove the Scripture wrong. In Israel, they use the Bible to confirm history. They don't use history to confirm the Bible. They say, well, if it's in the Bible, then it's gotta be here, so let's go where it says and find it. And they go and find whatever it is the Bible says will be there. There's no religion on earth that can do that. None, 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 none. So um, why believe the Bible? Because of stuff like this. The way it's written is so miraculous and so incredible. So don't be moved by anything else. All right, let's move on. Let's move on by rereading uh, Revelation 10.1 because it's, it's the thing today. Revelation 10.1 again says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud. That's a classic view of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, can always, pretty much always, uh, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. The Lord Jesus is described as having a rainbow over his throne in Revelation 4. His face shone like the sun. That's how Jesus was described in Revelation 1. And his feet were like pillars of fire, also a description of the Lord Jesus in Revelation 1. So very cool little thing there to camp on for a minute. Then verse 2. And in his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. Remember, this all started with the scroll given to Jesus and, and his beginning to take uh, the seals off the scroll in chapter 6. Uh, so this is a small scroll in his hand that had been opened. He stood, look at, look at, just think about this description of this angel. It's a majestic mighty angel and his right foot is standing on the sea and his left foot is standing on the land. This is a position of ruling and reigning. It's a position of authority, the authority of heaven over earth. To have, have this angel, especially uh, if it is indeed Jesus, which it sure seems to be, standing with one foot on the ocean, one foot on the land, um, he is large and in charge. And he's, and, he, and he's got a small scroll in his hand. Look at verse three. And he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion, like maybe the lion of Judah. He gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. When he shouted, the seven thunders, Thunders answered. This scene just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more majestic. This, this mighty angel, possibly Jesus himself, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, position of authority and rulership over the earth. He shouts, he gives a great shout like the roar of a lion and seven thunders answer him as in obedience. It is a huge, huge deal. It's a majestic moment that 
that has John reeling. I was thinking yesterday while I was writing this, um, I should have been thinking if H.A. Aaronside's name was Henry or Harry, but instead, I was thinking about being on the island of Patmos and how cool it was to be there and how cool it would be to go to the island of Patmos and teach the entire book of Revelation there. Like, you know, condensed version like Amir does. Um, but it's, it's, there's this one beach there. It's, it's called the Fine Sand Beach, and we'll talk about it when we get to Revelation 13. But um, it's just an incredible place that you picture this stuff happening. And, and this is where, this is where I, I picture John seeing this and being in such awe and being moved so much. And, and I would think that if I were writing the book of Revelation, I don't mean rewriting it like, you know, like Muhammad did, uh, rewrote the Old Testament into the Quran or, or uh, what's the guy, what's the kid's name, Joey Smith uh, back there who... Uh, <laughs> Yusuf wrote his own Bible. I mean, there's all those, all those, there's all those people. Uh, none of them have a leg to stand on, by the way. Uh, but if I were writing the book of Revelation, I would be like thinking the same thing that John is thinking right now. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, man, this is incredible. This angel and the authority and he, the roar and the, the, the thunders answering him. I have to write this down. Like, that's my job if I'm John. Like, I have to record this. And so we read in Revelation 10, verse 4, when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Really? After all of this buildup, this is an incredible buildup. The cloud, the angel, the rainbow, the sun, the fire, the roar, the thunder, and then a voice from heaven that has to be God himself says, don't write a word of it. Don't write a word of what you've just heard. I think that God's like, it's too big. What you've just seen is too big. It's too majestic. It's too mysterious. You, you, you know, like, these people can't handle the truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, like, we have to limit what we reveal to them. Listen, it's a mystery. But a mystery in the Bible is not like, uh, like the TV shows my wife likes to watch. She watches uh, Mystery Theater, PBS. Don't support PBS. They're radical, woke, liberal activists. But, but, but Mystery Theater, it's not this kind of mystery. A mystery in the Bible is just something that God has chosen not to reveal. And because he's God, he has the right to choose not to reveal it. And because we're not God, we don't have the right to demand or expect him to reveal it. If he just says it's not to be revealed, then it's, it's got to not be revealed. It's a mystery. I don't know why, but, but the whole context here is something so big and so majestic that we have to be in awe about it, which is the primary purpose of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not to tickle our ears or sell grocery store tabloids. It's, it's to make us be in awe of who God is. John is reeling. He's seeing something so majestic. He knows that it's it's heaven displaying ownership, authority over the earth. And whatever else he heard that he wasn't allowed to write, the next thing that he sees seals the deal on the majesty and the mystery. Look at verse five and six. This is when it really, really comes, comes with, down with power here. Revelation 10, verse five. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath 
in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. That's a big deal. This angel, in the majesty that he comes in with the mystery of the seven thunders speaking that we're supposed to be left in awe about, he stands one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. He raises his right hand and he swears an oath. And he swears an oath standing in authority over the earth and he swears an oath to the one who lives forever, who has created all that's been created, And what's the oath that he swears? There will be no more delay. What do you mean no more delay? Man, we are 22 messages into Revelation. We are in chapter 10. We were not thinking there had been a delay. We weren't thinking like, wow, I wonder when the judgment's really gonna start. We've been through some serious judgment, some unimaginable judgment. We've been through, through judgment on, on earth for quite some time. Why is this majestic angel swearing an oath that there'll be no more delay? Here's why. Because the judgment that's been poured out on the earth, as radical as it is, has been measured and restrained because the purpose has been to draw people to repentance. And remember, we talked last week about the son of the judgment of God, S-O-N, I'm sorry, (laughs) S-U-N, the sun, like the sun in the sky. If your heart is clay, the son of God's judgment will make it harder, sun, S-U-N, the sun. If your heart is wax, the son of God's judgment will melt it. Well, that's what God's been doing is he's been melting every heart that would be willingly be melted. And we know that there's been salvation. We know there's been repentance. We know the 144,000 are on the earth, but now the time has run out for measured and restrained judgment. There is no more delay. The final phase of God's wrath, of his judgment upon sin and the evil of the world, and the final, the beginning of the final steps of his victory are about to begin. So it's an ominous, ominous moment. And many times, uh, I forget, what. well, Jeremiah is a big one, but a number of times in the Old Testament, the cup of God's wrath is referenced. And when we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, if, there, if there's any way this cup could pass from me, it's a reference to the cup of wrath from the Old Testament seen in Jeremiah 25 for sure. Um, this is the cup of wrath being filled up for the world. And so they've gotten little splashes, little spoonfuls of God's wrath. But the world itself and the evil and sin of the world has filled the cup of God's wrath up to overflowing, and it's about to be poured out. That's why this mighty angel swears an oath that there will be no more delay. And then Revelation 10, verse 7, notice by the quotes that it's still the angel speaking. The quotes start at the end of verse 6, Go to the end of verse seven. Revelation 10, seven says, when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, that's opening up the seven bold judgments, the final set of judgments. When that happens, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. So, This angel is swearing an oath that there's no more delay and what's about to happen is going to fulfill God's mysterious plan just as it was prophesied. When the seventh trumpet judgment brings the seventh bowl or seventh vile judgments poured out on the earth, God's mysterious plan is gonna be fulfilled. So the obvious question is, what is God's mysterious plan? Do you think we have a tendency to get a little myopic with scripture? You know, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna, you know, I don't want I don't wanna be uh, 
cynical. <laughs> I'm saying I don't want to be. <laughs> but because, because Pam does this, and, I, and it's good, it's good. But you know how we take a little bit of a verse and we, and we put it on a nice picture and put it on Instagram? That's okay, babe, you, gotta, you should keep doing it. Do it for us, do it for Word by Mail in the church. And it's good, it's good you do that. Just a little bit of a shot in the arm and, and that's, you know, it's good. And, and I do that, I meditate on verses. I'm sometimes, you know, believe it or not, you know, if something goes wrong and I'm looking at social media, uh, I'll even meditate on a verse, like Pam's verses that she puts up. I mean, I'll, I'll do that. But listen, please, please hear me. Pan out. Step back and say, God, what is the purpose of all of this? What is your mysterious plan? We have been trained to be worried about two things, today and tomorrow right? But, but, but God's like, you know, hey, you know, zoom out a little bit. Get an eternal perspective a little bit. When we, when we talk about the mysterious plan of God being fulfilled, in the fullest sense, we're talking about the plan of salvation brought through the work of Jesus Christ, accomplishing all that it is meant to accomplish. That's a lot. That's a mouthful. And yes, it includes your salvation. And for you, that's the most important part of God's plan, is your personal salvation in Christ. But when we look out at, at the big picture of the mysterious plan of God, we have to see that... that um, you know, that it's bigger, it's bigger than just our salvation. I know that I, I struggle even saying that, but let me give you, let me give you an explanation. All of creation, all of creation is going to be set free from the curse of sin and the evil in this world. Just write down in your margins, Romans 8, 19 to 23. I'm just gonna read a few of those verses. You read them all later. Romans 8, 19 says this, it's on the screens. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. That's, that's the part of the mysterious plan of God that impacts all of creation. All of creation is waiting for this mysterious plan of God to be uh, fulfilled, to be consummated in the, the children of God being revealed. That's us. Verse 21 there in Romans 8 says, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. You wanna know what 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 part of what God's mysterious plan being fulfilled is. It's all of creation looking forward to the day uh, when it will join us in the glorious freedom from death and decay. And then in verse 23, Romans 8 says, and we believers, we too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies that he's promised to us. Listen, we don't understand that. All right, we don't understand that. You know, we don't, we don't, we can't grasp what it means to be a joint heir of Jesus Christ, to share in the inheritance of the Son of God for eternity. I, we don't have, what do we relate that to? Like, you know, oh, you know, Whatever, I mean, I, I, I don't know. What do you relate? You can't relate it to anything because we can't imagine it. This is part of, what the, of, of God's mysterious plan being completed. God is going to return this earth and more importantly, our relationships with him to a Garden of Eden state. So, so when, God, when God created man in the Garden of Eden, he created man there, meaning mankind, 
for relationships so that he could walk with them, so that he could be with them in, in a relationship, in a sinless environment. So sin stopped that. The fulfillment of God's mysterious plan is returning, especially our relationship with him, to that but also the world to a Garden of Eden state. But listen, the new heaven and the new earth is not like, um, like okay, like I imagine the Garden of Eden like, um, like kind of, you know, like Hawaii without the humidity or like, <laughs> like a tropical jungle without the bugs. Um, you know, like, I, I, like I, I don't know what we imagine the Garden of Eden is like, but the new heaven and the new earth are indescribable. They cannot be described. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. Write this down, 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Paul was given a glimpse of the third heaven, and in case you get some Mormon crazy in on you, um, the third heaven is not some place you achieve uh, by doing more temple work, okay? Uh, uh, listen, the atmosphere where we breathe is the first heaven. Space is the second heaven. The heaven where God exists is the third heaven. It's beyond what we call space. Um, so Paul's caught up to the third heaven. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 4. I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. We have to understand that, that the, the fulfillment of God's mysterious plan through Jesus Christ is more than we can really like put together. It's bigger. We need to be just in awe of it. And, and really what we need to do is just say, look, Lord, I know that I can't really fathom all of it, but I wanna make sure I'm there. So let's just deal with that and then we'll find out what it looks like when we get there, right? Ooh, that's good. Listen, if you want a hint, if you just wanna, this, this should not be a surprise, okay, what I'm about to share with you. If you want to know a little bit about how it all ends, turn to the back of the book and read it. You turn to Revelation 21 and 22, and you're going to be like, whoa, that's how it ends? Like, this is good. Everything is good. Read Revelation 21 and 22. This ends well for those who are in Christ. It ends really, really well. So you might say... Why has God waited so long? Well, why, I mean, you know, well, you know how the scientists, those people that know everything, you know, say that the earth is like 100 quadzillion trillion billion years old uh, because this rock says so. Uh, okay. <laughs> Listen, I don't know how old the earth is, but, but, but let's just say you know, for fun, let's just say 7,000 years, just, just for fun. Um, you know, I don't know, 10 maybe, I don't, I don't know. But it's not 100 quadzillion billion uh, because, you know, somebody said so who has a degree. Um, anyway, why has God waited so long? Why, why has he let the world get so bad? Why has he allowed so much suffering? People ask me that all the time. Well, if God's a God of love, why has he allowed so much suffering? And here's what I tell them, and here's what I tell you. Maybe it's so you can be saved. Maybe God waited for you. Maybe God was waiting for you to be saved so that you would be part of the new heaven and the new earth. What about that? What if that's the reason he was waiting? So here's a cool experiment, all right? And if you know somebody's not saved, you know, invite them to, to, to you know, to try this. There is, there is the last person who's gonna be saved before the rapture, right? What if it's you? Like, what if you're the last person that's gonna be saved before the rapture? So, so here's the idea, go for it. Like, try it, get saved, and then see if you're the last person. Right? So you can like be, amen. Ah, guess it wasn't me. The good news is you're still saved. 
Listen, we we don't know why God's waiting, but I'm glad he waited till April 29th, 1979. Because that's the day I got saved. Every day I'm glad he's waiting. Every day. And we should be too. All right. Continuing. Revelation 10, verse 8, as we jump ahead. <laughs> Here's the bad thing about second service. First service, uh, this, is, this is the honest truth. We have proof on video. I ended early. So you know what that means, right? I have plenty of time to ramble in the second service. Revelation 10, verse 8. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again. Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And so suddenly John becomes a participant instead of just a reporter. And we continue in verse nine, Revelation 10, nine and 10. John says, so I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. Verse 10, so I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. We're gonna see in a minute that this scroll is the record of events that must take place from this point till the end of the tribulation. And God is saying to John, Listen, maybe this is why he didn't, he didn't have him write what the seven thunders said. He's saying to John, it's not good enough for you to see it. It's not good enough for you to hear it. It's not good enough for you to even write it down. You must consume it. What's about to happen? You must consume. It must become part of you. And I believe wholeheartedly that God is using, this is the third time in the Bible he's done this, um, God is using John as an illustration for us because we have a tendency to watch Revelation, to like be like, oh, well, how about that? There's scorpions and there's this and there's that and oh, that's, oh, that's it. Listen, 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 listen. That's not why the book is written. It's not written to, to tickle our ears or to give us some fanciful you know, imagination. It's one thing for John to be intrigued, even in awe of what he saw. It's a whole different thing for him to consume what God needs him to consume. And for us, it's one thing for us to see revelation and be all like, woo, man, you know, Bono is the Antichrist, you know, whatever. Um, and listen, just because, just because you're not seeing Obama doesn't mean that he's not the Antichrist, right? <laughs> he's still running the country, okay? Um, so, you know, I still, whatever. Uh, whoever it is, that's really not why the book's written. It's different for us to skim through Revelation and say, oh, that's interesting, than for us to consume it. We have to consume it. We have to consume it. And listen, the reason it says in verse nine, well, nine and 10, that, that when we consume the word of God, when John consumes this scroll, it will be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. Here's why, please hear me. If you receive what God has to say, it will be sweet because it will be your salvation and your eternal life. If you reject what God has to say, then it will be sour and bitter and will lead to you paying for your own sins instead of Christ paying for them on your behalf. And so that's what most people agree is the reason for, it's not like Chinese takeout, you know, it's not sweet and sour chicken, it's, it's, <laughs> It's a reference to salvation or judgment. 
Here's why, Revelation 10, verse 11, it says, then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And so again, John's saying, I'm sorry, God is saying to John, it's not enough for you to see this, you have to consume it, because why? Because you have to speak it out. You have to prophesy, you have to speak about it. And listen to me, please, you you saw it in Lisa today, I, I pray that you see it on a regular basis here, but 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 listen, you know, man, I it's this is really hard, but like like I went to school, you know, you know, I went you went to Bible college. And uh I you know, think think well, anyway, a teacher, a teacher can stand up and say, oh, la, 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 yeah, this revelation, and this and this historically, and this uh, and this is uh, you know, this is our doctrine, la, 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 and you're just like but, but when you consume the word of God, it lights a consuming fire in you and it transforms you and you become a living testimony of the word of God. Not because you've studied, um, well, I mean, it depends on how you're studying it, but it's not because you have intellectual knowledge. It's because you've consumed God's word. And so it comes out of you with power. And when you see that in people, you know the difference between intellectual knowledge and personal knowledge when Christ uh, lives in you. Is that, is that good? Okay, three times in the Bible, God has had uh, his prophets, if you will, consume the word. Ezekiel 3 for Ezekiel, Jeremiah 15 for Jeremiah, and John here. When God calls you to, to be a living testimony, he calls us to consume his word. Let's move on. It's a great illustration. All right, so let's review. In Revelation chapter one, no, <laughs> just kidding. This is a monumental moment in Revelation. It's monumental, that's why it's another reason why we believe this majestic angel is Jesus because what's coming next after one more interlude is the beginning of the fulfillment of the mysterious plan of God. Like we're stepping into it now. We're, we're crossing the midway point. We're gonna, we're gonna see all that stuff, the Antichrist and, the, and all the stuff starting next week. Um, but it means more than that because it means that we're gonna get to you know, Revelation 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 and, and just the glory of, of seeing all we can take of the mysterious plan of God being fulfilled in our lives and in the earth. So here's uh, what matters. Jesus Christ has made a way for you personally to be, um, it's not just be in this victory, it's to have this victory, to possess this victory, to possess this fulfillment of the mysterious plan of God. His victory is complete, it was finished. In the cross and the, and the resurrection, it was done. The rest of it is just kind of working out what's already been accomplished. The victory's won, it's already been finished, but God still gives you a choice. And if anybody tells you he doesn't, have them read their Bible. He gives you a choice. It's all done. And so now we have to say, oh, I'm not really sure. Live for eternity in the fulfilled, mysterious plan of God or join the devil and his angels separated from God in judgment. Why? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Choose life. Choose life. This is the way it's going to go down. Jesus has already made a way for you to be there with him 
in eternity, in eternal victory and all that, that comes with this. And he can set you free right now from the bondage of sin, the bondage of this world. He can set you free from sin and death and the grave. You can have eternal life today by putting your full faith in him to make sure you're part of this victory when it all unfolds. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, really, Lord, all this is gonna happen with or without us. But Lord, I pray that, that we would desire so much to be in your victory, to be in your eternity, to be freed from the bondage of sin and, and the flesh in this world, to be freed from death in the grave, to be assured of an eternity in your presence instead of removed from your presence, God. Lord, make this eternal life choice clear to us, please. And if you're here in the room or online, I pray today would be the day of your salvation. It's a day we cry out, Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sin that must receive the wrath of your judgment. Please come into my life and make me righteous through faith in you. Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform my life here so that I can live in a glorified life in eternity with you. I make you my Savior and my Lord. I pray you would carry me to the day I see you face to face. In your name, Jesus. Amen.